let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the privilege of coming together and worshiping and adoring you this morning. Thank you for the many ways that you have protected us since we last met together as this group. Father, we acknowledge that many times in this room, you have visited with us and spoken to us. And we ask that you'd speak to each one of us. Thank you that you know us through and through. And we ask that each one of us would be renewed and afreshed in remembering that Jesus is able all the time to meet all our needs. So we ask now that as we look into your word, you would speak to us for your children are listening. And we ask that you would teach us to love what is good and to do what is right for Jesus' sake. And it's in his name we pray, amen. amen. Back in the mid-1990s, my husband Jim and I hosted an exchange student from Eastern Europe, and we'll call him Sergei. And uh, Sergei stayed with us for several years, and he was the only child of a wealthy family. His father was a politician. He was a member of the Ukrainian Duma, and he's also a merchant marine captain. So Sergei enjoyed much of the finest living in Ukraine. He came to live with us, and we enjoyed teaching him about American culture and the truths of the faith, and particularly how our church youth group embraced him and uh, taught him about Jesus. Now, for the first eight months that Sergei lived with us, one of the favorite things that he enjoyed doing was going to Walmart with me. Now, when I go to Walmart, I have my list, I go in, and I come out. <laughs> I soon learned to dread more than most things taking Sergey to Walmart with me. He loved electronics and was always needing batteries for something. He would linger and marvel in the battery aisle for 20 minutes at the choices, the variety, he would sit there and read the packages and decide which batteries he needed, while all I wanted to do was run in for a loaf of bread and a can of cat food. <laughs> Choices. All the money and influence in Ukraine couldn't buy what was on the shelves. And so the choices that he had at this mundane Walmart store in Katanning, PA, was just something that he cherished, and he would deliberate constantly over whatever purchase he had. Our passages today also bring up the topic of choices, and so I'd like for you to turn to Joshua chapter 24. And the context in Joshua 24 is we have Joshua, and this is his swan song. Okay? He's about to die by the end of the chapter, will be notified of his death, He's the military commander. He's the servant of the Lord. His public ministry is about to come to an end. And just as his mentor Moses had done before him, he leads the people in a covenant renewal ceremony. And we're told in verse 1 that this takes place at Shechem. Now, Shechem was a place of deep religious significance for the Israelites. In fact, second only in religious import to Jerusalem. Way back in Genesis 12, we're told that when Abraham first entered the land of Canaan, he went to Shechem. And it was there in Shechem that the Lord told him that someday his descendants would inherit the entire land. And in response, Abraham built an altar and consecrated the land. It's also the place where Jacob, after he returned from Mesopotamia, where he settled, and where he had his family bring all their household gods and bury them under a tree in Shechem. It's also the place where these very people whom Joshua is about to speak to, when they first entered the land, and after they defeated the town of Ai, where they had come together and committed themselves in a covenant renewal ceremony, to the Lord. So here, it's near the end of his life, 
Joshua leads this wilderness baby generation in this covenant renewal ceremony. That's essentially a renunciation of all the idols, and he does it in a place that was honored by their ancestors having done the same thing. Now, Joshua begins by recounting the goodness and the faithfulness of the Lord in Israel's history, giving the details of God's covenant chesed to his people. And he highlights four particular historical events. Now, you typically, when the Israelites would talk about their ancestors, they would talk about their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But notice in verse 2 what Joshua does. He goes back behind Abraham, and he mentions Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, the brother. They lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. You see, when the Lord called Abraham out of Mesopotamia and into Canaan, he wasn't doing this as a reward for Abraham's righteousness. Abraham was simply an idol worshiper with his family. The call of Abraham was nothing more than God's unmerited grace. The second historical event that Joshua highlights is the redemption out of Egypt. The third is the defeat of the Amorites and the Moabites east of the Jordan. And the fourth historical event that he highlights is the entry into and the victory over the Canaanites. And notice what Joshua highlights in verse 13. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. The emphasis in Joshua's historical recounting is clearly the Lord's unfailing faithfulness and his unchanging sufficiency. And so based on this, Joshua gives the charge in verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And then notice what he says in verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems evil to you, if serving the Lord seems evil to you, well, I have a few options. Then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. So if it's evil, if they don't want to serve the Lord, Joshua points out the availability of other options and offers a choice. There's a sentimental option. If you're tied to the past, well, then you can always go back and worship the gods of your fathers back east of the Euphrates. Or perhaps you're the more adventurous type. Well, then there's a pantheon of current options offered by the inhabitants of the newly conquered land. Now, Joshua is not presenting these as equally acceptable alternatives for Israel's allegiance. It's a rhetorical device, and what he's doing is he's highlighting the necessity of being wholly committed to the Lord. And then, as a good leader does, he leads by example and declares, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then the response of the people in verses 16 to 18 is this energetic. They review the history of their covenant God's faithfulness to them, and they declare at the end of verse 18, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And so the lectionary reading ends. But if you listen carefully to the gospel reading in John 6 and the epistle reading in Ephesians 6, both of those passages prompt us to read on in Joshua 24. If I were Joshua, the end of my life, about to retire, I might have been tempted to hurriedly accept the Israelites' declaration at face value and have them sign on the dotted line. Not so with Joshua. Look at his words back to them in verse 19. You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord, 
and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. You can't serve the Lord. Stop the presses, Joshua says. It's as if I want you to think for a moment that we're at a Billy Graham rally and Reverend Graham has given a gospel message and given the invitation for folks to come forward and receive Jesus. And the piano is playing just as I am. People start coming forward and uh, somebody with a soothing voice gets on the mic and says, if you're here with a crowd, they'll wait. If you're here with a bus, the buses will wait for you. And it's as if Joshua grabs the microphone and says, stop the presses, go back. The buses aren't going to wait for you and we're not paying for your ticket home. <laughs> you can't serve the Lord. What's Joshua doing here? Well, in the rehearsing of Israel's covenant relationship with the Lord, the people ought to have realized that in response to the Lord's faithfulness, repeatedly their response has been one of faithlessness. But they continue to insist that they are wholeheartedly committed to the Lord. There's a back and forth between them and Joshua. And finally, in verses 22 and 23, Joshua declares to them, you are witnesses against yourselves. Throw away your idols. Now, if you were to continue in the rest of the chapter, we learn that the Israelites remained faithful to the Lord as long as Joshua lived and as long as the elders who outlived him lived. But after Joshua 24 comes the book of Judges. And it's a book of the spiraling down into more depravity and more depravity of the Israelites. Until at the end of the book of Judges, the, rep the refrain is repeated four times. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Persistent faithfulness over the long haul simply did not ensue. You see, Joshua wanted the Israelites to understand the seriousness of their commitment. It couldn't be something that was entered casually or flippantly or without divine enabling. Now, we're not in Israel's position, and I guess it's up to me to be the bearer of very disappointing news to our juniors, but please hear me carefully. Ambridge is not the promised land. <laughs> but what was true for Israel is true for us today. Neither, neither the Israelites in Joshua's day, nor we today, can maintain covenant fidelity simply based on sheer determination. Neither the Israelites of Joshua's day, nor we here today, can live covenant faithful lives based on our own strength. In fact, how much more today? The Ephesians passage that was read, Paul sums up his epistle to the Ephesians by charging them to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, to take up the full armor of God so that they might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemies aren't the Girgashites and the Perizzites and the Amorites and the Moabites, but they're the principalities and powers, the powers of darkness, the authorities of evil, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. In the gospel lesson for today, in John 6, we find Jesus in the synagogue at Capernaum, and we reach the climax of his bread of life discourse. And we find that like Joshua, Jesus is equally exclusive. He presses home the gravity of the choice to follow him. And he accentuates the graveness by not backing down when the disciples grumble and declare that his teaching is a hard teaching. He refuses to minimize the difficulties involved 
with choosing to follow him exclusively. Jesus refuses this to soften the edges to make his message a bit more palatable to his audience. He wants his followers to understand the cost of following him. As one commentator observed, quote, as, as has been Jesus' habit throughout his conversation, he meets objections by sharpening the point of his message, raising the offense rather than softening it, and thereby bringing the conversation to a crisis. As a result, according to verse 66 of our gospel reading, in response to these hard teachings, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, in a few moments, we're about to engage in a practice that we do every year here at Convocation at Trinity. It's something called affirming of the covenant and our statement of faith. It's where we publicly commit ourselves to conduct our lives in accordance with Trinity's covenant. It's what we believe faithful kingdom living looks like in our seminary context here. And as we read the words, we might be lulled into thinking, this is no biggie, and we might be tempted to give a casual, flippant assent to what we are saying. It's early in the semester, after all. We just heard wonderful testimonies last Thursday and Friday of the awesomely creative ways that the Lord has brought the new junior class to be with us. It's early in the semester. Um, we don't quite have too many assignments due yet, but we know that the trials will come. We'll start to see the less than pleasant side of one another. We'll, we'll get anxious as the assignments mount up. Some relationships will sour. And then there's the weather in December, January, February. <laughs> Let's stop, we don't wanna to get too gloomy. You get my point. Let's enter the covenant with a due sense of soberness, realizing that what we do here day in and day out at Trinity is quite a dangerous enterprise. We handle God's word and the truths of the faith, and we simply can't do this day in and day out and remain unchanged. You will not leave Trinity the way you entered. Either you grow more and more into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or you grow hardened, dear friends. As I was writing the sermon, I thought of another Eastern European young man. His name was Joseph. And in 1895, he entered seminary in Georgia, the Georgian part of Russia, and he spent five years there. He never graduated. He left before the final exams. And he made choices. He supposedly, according to his biographers, was one of the sharpest students. He had an exceptional, exceptional memory and accounts of how much of the New Testament he had memorized um, aren't quite clear. He made a choice, he made many choices, and he made many choices that led him on a path of unadulterated evil. I'm talking about Joseph Stalin, who was responsible for murdering, at conservative estimates, 20 million people. So as we start this new semester, as we enter into covenant, let's do it soberly. And yet we also do it with joyous confidence because there's something else we do today. We come to the table. And so we come with confidence, remembering that the new covenant in Christ's blood is infinitely greater than the old covenant. Our inheritance is so much greater than a plot of land over there in the Middle East. Do you realize that everything Jesus accomplished and inherited is ours by virtue of our union with him? Everything that we need, all the resources we have in Jesus Christ. We labor, as Paul says in Colossians, there's stuff we do, but we labor with his energy. He has all the resources that we need to live lives of covenant faithfulness day by day and for the long haul. After the many disciples left Jesus in unbelief, Jesus looks to the 12 and asks, will you desert me also? And may Simon Peter's words be our testimony this morning. Lord, to whom else shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One from God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.